Well, let's uh, continue uh, as we get into the last part five of our series. The biggest difference between people who flourish in life, who do well in relationships, is not IQ. It's certainly not money. It's these, often these things we are so preoccupied with, those are not the things that directly contribute to us doing well in life and flourishing. It's not talent. It's not good looks. Usually, the biggest contributor is making wise decisions. Making wise decisions. It's so important. I read a study this week that said the average person makes 70 conscious decisions a day. Now, we do a lot of things by habit, but 70 conscious decisions a day a day, which amounts to 25,550 decisions a year. And uh, over 70 years, that's 1,788,500 decisions. You put that all together, that's basically your life. Albert Camus said, life is a sum of all your choices. And that's really who you are. That's what you build. I mean, it's just, you can summarize your life in your choices. And it's so easy to make a bad decision. Let me, about let me tell you one I did recently. About three weeks ago, I was helping somebody move. I showed up at his house. They needed my vehicle, so I showed up at my house in my car. And we had a little truck as well. The truck, it was kind of getting dark, and the truck pulled up in the, in, the, in the driveway. On one side of the driveway was some stuff that they, were, uh, they didn't need. They were either going to let neighbors take it, I guess, or the driveway or the pickup you know, would come up and get it. They'd throw it in the trash. And so I parked in front of the house. And I got out, and already there's some young people there. They're pulling stuff out from downstairs, from the upstairs, and they're hauling stuff out. They need room in my car. So I'll, I pull out anything that's in my car. I put it on the grass right there. <laughs> you can see where this is going. <laughs> so uh, so the, anyways, the cars get packed up, tied down, and the, the couple of the young guys grab, drive both of the vehicles, and they leave. And uh, by then, it's dark. And, uh, and so I'm talking to everybody. We end up going inside and sitting down and talking for just about five, 10 minutes. And, uh, and then Sharon comes. She's, gonna, she's bringing her car, and we're going to now start filling her car. She comes after about 10 minutes. And I get up to greet her, and it dawns on me right then, oh, no, I left that stuff outside. I go outside, and I, I walk up to it. And, I, and one of the things, I had had some tubs, some rope, and different things. And I also had my laptop case Filled with my laptop, my iPad, and some, some private documents. It's gone. I think, oh, no, that's a bad decision just by the way, okay? You do not leave because the car is gone. It's at the side of the road. And Sharon goes, and I tell her that. I go, Sharon, I, just, I left all the stuff. I had my laptop there. And I can see it in her eyes. She's thinking, you did what? You know? <laughs> she didn't say anything, though, which was a good decision. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going, oh, no, I can't believe my, it's gone, you know. And she goes, well, I saw some lady. She was like rummaging through this stuff. She, I, she might have taken. I said, well, do you, do you remember what she looked like? And uh, she goes, I don't know, maybe. It was kind of dark. And so I jump in the passenger side of the car. We go down one side, all the way down to the end of the street, real slow, looking, nobody. Go down all the way to the other side of the street, looking, nobody. I get onto my phone, and I go into Find Your Devices, they're offline, so they're gone, you know, it's just, and then I'm thinking, oh, my stomach, I feel sick to my stomach, I'm telling Sharon that, oh, I'm just, my stomach, I feel like I'm going to throw up, I can't believe this, and I hadn't saved the documents in a long time, and, you know, I didn't do backup like I should have, and uh, the cost of it, on top of it, nobody's going to feel sympathy for me, because it's, I just, that was dumb, right, if you tell somebody the story, you're all thinking, well, that was dumb, you know, <laughs> so I'm feeling so bad, and, and we're coming back. we kind of resigning. It's gone as we're about to drive into the driveway. A lady comes out of her house holding my laptop case. And so I jump out. I go, wow, that's all mine, you know. <laughs> and she goes, well, I, it looked expensive. It looked like it was valuable, and people were out there looking through stuff. So I went over, and I got it because yeah, I knew that, you know, somebody might need that. I said, well, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so she gave it to me, and, you know, I said, can I hug you? Which is like a big deal for me, you know, I'm like hugging this stranger. I'm so happy, you know. It's just, uh, so it worked out for me, but you know, <clears throat> when we make bad decisions, a lot of times it doesn't work out like that, right? Sometimes it's, it ends in a real bad, you know, situation. And so that's why good decisions are so important, because we do 70 
conscious decisions a day. 25,000 a year. They add up. And so it's it's really good to take a moment as we're wrapping up this series in Designing Your Destiny and to talk about, and, and we're talking about planning out goals and for 10 years, how do we make good decisions day after day so we end up where we want to be. And what we're going to do is look at some texts, and there's really kind of the, the, the bedrock of the texts come from this guy named Solomon. Solomon was this really wise guy, but he, it, it happened because he prayed for that. It happened because he, made, he walked into that with certain things he did. We're going to look at his life real briefly, at least a portion of it. And, and just to kind of look at, if you have your Bibles open up there into uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, <clears throat> there we see, uh, <clears throat> we see uh, a little bit about Solomon's life. Solomon at this stage is a young man. His father has just died. His father was King David. He's taking over now. He has this big nation. He's, he doesn't have the experience. He's not sure what to do. And he's trying to step into this new role. And so he has this dream. Here's how it goes. That Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. Ask what I shall give you. In other words, he's saying, uh, you know, here's a blank check. Whatever you want, ask. You know, kind of like that old game, you know, if you had three wishes, or what would you wish for? He's, you know, he he's gets this. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David and, and my father because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness, the heart towards, uh, of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. It's a humble way of saying, hey, I'm not sure what to do. I'm inexperienced. He goes, I do not know how to come in or how to go out or to come in. Leaders would often say this. I don't know how to do this job. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted in multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? And so here he's, his first thing he's asking for is this to make, he's saying, okay, I, I have a decision to make. I want to make great decisions. It's, I, want, I want to know how to, all these, these 70 conscious decisions a day, the 25,000 a year, I want, to, I want to do that. Now let me ask you, have you ever done that? Have you ever asked for that? That's what Solomon asked for. And it pleases God. It says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you or none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. So God's thrilled at this. He goes, hey, that's the right thing to ask for. And kind of the idea behind this is, is when you make wise decisions, these other things that often people want, they kind of follow that person. They follow that person. In other words, somebody who makes wise decisions financially means they, they probably work hard. They, they know how to keep their budget in line. They don't spend more than they, than they earn. They know how to save. They know how to invest. They give generously. They, they don't get into debt. They, 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 they manage all that. That's, those are wise decisions. And what happens is they become financially prosperous. The same thing with your health. If you make wise decisions with your health, it means you're eating right, that you maintain your, 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 your ideal weight, that you go to the doctor when you need to go and then bless financial life, I mean, a healthy life often follows those people. That happens in, in, uh, in honor and having a good name. You know, when, you're, when you make wise decisions, you live a life of integrity. You're, you treat people fairly. People want to be around you. And the same thing with excess in, uh, in, your, in your work. Wise people learn to use time very, very well. They're very conscious 
of each minute of the day, how they're using it. They don't just waste time. And they end up prospering because they're always honing their gifts. They're working. They don't coast. They, they're always working through a whole life. And it ends up being a blessing. So it's wise decisions really does connect with all those other things. And, and they often follow one another. One bad decision can cause another one and then another one, right? And the same thing with good decisions. So that's why there's this momentum that can happen. <clears throat> so what I want to do is, is just look at, real briefly, five things we see that really come from Solomon's life and, uh, and how we can implement that so that you can do that. So it's not just a good theor- theoretical discussion, the way, to imp- to, the way to make this work for you is just think of something this week you're dealing with, something you need to make a decision on, and then how you can apply these five things. First of all, is if you want to have God-honoring decisions, you need to pray. That kind of makes sense, right? You pray. You ask God for that. That's what Solomon did. That's kind of the beginning of it. He says, James says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to you. So the beginning part is just asking God and recognizing that's when, when we're praying about, oh God, what do you want me to do for my life? This often is uh, an area of misunderstanding. You know, we're talking about planning 10 years out. God, what do you want me to do for my life? And sometimes we get stuck there, right? What, what am I supposed to do? When I was in college and I was praying about, what am I supposed to do? I hadn't decided to go into ministry, and I was praying about it, but I was thinking about other things. God, what, what am I supposed to do? And I got like silence, and that was kind of weird, you know, I was thinking, why? Well, I, I want to know what I'm supposed to do. But what I discovered was God is more interested in who we become than what we're to do. Who we become is, is, is his, on top of his list. Often for us, it's Tell me what to do. It's often for us, it's circumstantial. I just want to know, help me, you know, make, help me to know what I'm supposed to do. But God's very, very interested in character development and what happens through that process. And so we learn God wants us to grow in, 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 in decision making. That's part of it. His primary way to grow us in character is through decision making. Sometimes we make bad decisions. And then we grow from that, right? We go, oh, well, that didn't work out well for me. I don't think I'll try to do that anymore. Now, what's interesting is when God's developing our character, no matter what the circumstances are, that will not, that, that doesn't impede God forming our character. Good circumstances, bad circumstances, it doesn't matter. So <clears throat> we would need, to write, need to realize that that's God's primary thing. And so when we're thinking of planning out our life, we have to realize, what do I want to be in 10 years? That's a more important question than what do I want to do in 10 years? It's important. We want to know, well, what should, what should I be doing with my life? But what do I want to be? What, 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 how do I want God to form my character? That is way, way more important. You notice James here, he doesn't say that, oh, when, you're at a, when you have a, de- a tough decision to make and you don't like the anxiety, just, tell, just ask God and he'll tell you exactly what to do. No, he says, no. God will partner with you and give you wisdom in that situation. Together, you'll make, you'll, you'll, you'll make wise decisions. As opposed to God just showing you, you know, this is door number one, door number two, door number three. He wants to give you, develop your character. Number two is just pray for the right frame of mind. Pray for the right frame of mind. An anxious mind, an, uh, an exhausted body, often we, causes us to make poor decisions. Paul says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so this is a key principle in making good decisions, is having this this peace of mind. A good example of this would be Elijah. He's back, he's a prophet, and it's recorded in Kings. And he, he, uh, at one point in his life, he is uh, uh, having this spiritual battle uh, with uh, these other prophets of Baal, and and he calls fire down from heaven, and there's this great, uh, this, this great move of God, and uh, and so it's, it's he's like on this, you know, has all of these uh, these people watching. There's this great, a, a lot of people end up uh, 
you know, repenting, and, and, and then he's an athlete, and so he ends up r- outrunning a chariot, and it's a, it's a long day for him, he, and he's exhausted. And then he starts making some poor choices. He starts thinking about how he, you know, he wants to die. He's worried about uh, the queen, Jezebel, who wants to kill him. And so God's remedy, you see in the stories, is God has him sleep, and then he feeds him, and then he gives him more sleep, and then he feeds him, and then he rests, like, for 40 days of just resting, sleeping, and resting and eating, and that's, you make better choices when you recognize that. So many times people make bad choices when they're emotionally drained. They're, they're not self-aware even. And they're, they're, they're not in a good place emotionally. And then they step out, they make a decision, and then they end up regretting it. Much of wise choices is not about information. It's not just do I have the information It's often about emotional management, self-awareness, these things. In the Bible, if you look at the Bible, people that made decisions out of fear and exhaustion almost always made poor decisions. So you you gotta be careful of that. You're looking for the peace of God, guarding your heart and your mind. Number three, consider the long-term consequences and values involved in the decision. Now the Bible has, especially Proverbs, has a constant theme of being careful of rash decisions, not thinking of the long term. Uh, Solomon says, it is not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor be hasty and miss the way. And so uh, when we make decisions and we don't think of the implications of them, what, what will this result in? What will this make me be? Is again, that question of God's forming us. If I make this decision, how will that affect me who I am? in a month or a year or 10 years even. Let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> Let's say that uh, a married couple, they have different rhythms. One is, let's say he's a morning person. He gets up in the morning, he has his energy, he has his focus, he loves the morning. Where The wife, let's say, she's a night person, she's a night owl. She, she, that's where she's uh, focused. She doesn't like the mornings. In the night, she's got her energy. She's focused. That's where she really wants to connect, to bond, to talk. And so they don't really connect much. And so there's some frustration. And so finally, the wife just says, well, you know, why don't we just sleep in different rooms? That'll make it easier for us. And, um, you know, she's frustrated. He kind of is a little hurt, but he's not all that in touch with that. Uh, it, it, this is not autobiographical, by the way. It's, this, is not, this is not Sharon and I. We're fine. You don't have to, you don't have to be worried about it. But he's, he, he's, um, you know, he's kind of, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's a little hurt, but he, he goes with it. It's, it's logistics. It makes sense. And so they, they decide to do that. And then what happens, see, is, is all of the little times that they would normally connect, hundreds of times maybe even thousands, just the little, you know, the, the, the laughter, the little gesture, the touch, the kind word, the I love you. Many times now those are missed. And then they just kind of start to grow apart and distant. And then years down the road, one of them just says, well, you know, maybe we should just get divorced. And what's worse is, is it doesn't even feel like it's a surprise. It's kind of like that was the direction this was going all along. You see, sometimes a choice, a decision we make has a disproportionate influence on our life. And it seems so small. And yet it has long-term repercussions. So wise people, people that, that make wise choices, they think through those. This seems easy. This seems convenient. It's an easy way to address my situation right now that it's uncomfortable. But what is the long-term repercussions? What will that, what will I be like if you're married? What will we, what, what would that do to our marriage? And those kinds of things. You just think through them. A lot of people don't do that. And so they make poor choices. So you think through the long-term stuff. So you pray, pray for the right frame of mind. Consider the long-term consequences. Number four is get wise counsel. Get wise counsel. In other words, you get around you people that you can trust. People that have wisdom. People that have good character. People that, that care about you, and you let them speak into your life. Very often, God speaks to us through other people. Solomon, again, says in Proverbs twelve fifteen, the way of fools seems right to them. I love that phrase. 
It, it seems right. Why does uh, the way of fools seem right to them? Because they're fools, right? If you're a fool, I, and, and there's really kind of a fool in all of us, right? There's a fool in me. There's a fool in you. Just to make, you know, we can make poor decisions, right? Look to the person next to you. Just look at them and say, there's a fool in you. <laughs> you're going, I didn't come to church to get offended, man. What's, what's going on here? <laughs> but there is a little, there's a part of that. Why? Because we all have blind spots, right? We, we, we have, we're not perfect. None of us are, and that's cool. I'm glad that we're a church of imperfect people. Uh, that's part of God's grace working through us. But we are imperfect, and so there's this part where we need other people. We have to give them uh, permission to speak into our lives. But the wise listen to advice. In other words, you have a coachable spirit. That's something you can't mandate, mandate that. You can't legislate that. That's something you willingly walk into. You say, I want that in my life. A number of years ago, uh, I was given counsel to make sure this kind of counsel, get people in your life. So I set up, I talk to people that speak into my life. I have people that are wise and care about me, know my situation, that can speak into my life and in uh, and, and ministry, my soul and, and, uh, and, and relationally and financially and, and health-wise, all different ways. It's so kind of almost like a personal board of directors. The, the, our church has a board of directors. And so each of you having your own personal board of directors, people you, you handpick and you say, Could, can I check in with you from time to time? And, and uh, regularly, and, 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 and I, wanna, I want you to speak into my life. I know I have blind spots. I'm giving you permission to speak to those. There's a lot of wisdom that comes from that. And then you make wiser choices. Ironically, one of the greatest violators of this years later was Solomon himself. Solomon one day, he, you know, he asked for wisdom, and then later on, look at what happens. Same book, 1 Kings, it says he, talking about Solomon, had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. So here's a piece of advice. Advice, don't marry a thousand wives, okay? <laughs> and then you'll already be ahead of the wisest guy, you know? So the warning here is, is that it's not a one-time thing. This is a constant fight we fight our whole lives. We always have to go to God in prayer. We always have to check our attitude. We always have to look at the long-term repercussions. We always make sure and have people around us that help us overcome our blind spots. Otherwise, we end up just making more bad choices, and we don't want to do that. So you get wise counsel. Get wise counsel. You know, it's interesting. If you watch, if you, have you ever gone to court, you know, you, you go in there for a traffic ticket or something. I've gone to court a couple of times and, and I don't know, it always seems like I'm last to be heard, whatever my, and, and I, so I listen to all these and nobody's there because they, you know, nobody stands up and said, well, I had a, a wise people uh, who care about me, spoke into my life on this decision. No, it's a bunch of dumb decisions, right? One person after another. Just they're making dumb decisions. And so we avoid those when we get wise counsel. And then number five, put your decision into action with gusto and you trust God in the process. You put your action, your decision into action. Now, this is really important. You're clear about it and you make a decision. You see, you recognize that you're not, nobody's infallible, so you could make a decision, and, but you have to make a decision. Some people, they get so gripped with the fear of decision-making, they won't make a decision. They don't, they don't want to be wrong. And the fear of sinning and the fear of making a wrong decision are different. Fear of, of sin, is, is, that's a good fear, but not of making a wrong decision. Ronald Reagan said one of the things that taught him this is when he was a little kid, back in those days, they had cobblers that made you shoes. He went to a store, he was having shoes made, and they really only gave him two options, a square toe or a round toe. He goes, Ronnie, which, which shoe do you want? He goes, I, I don't know. He ended up leaving, not making a decision. So uh, two weeks later, he got the shoes delivered to him. One shoe was a square, <laughs> one was a round. And he realized from that point on, if I don't make decisions, other people will make them for me. And I don't want to do that. And so we have to, you can't get gripped with the fear of decision making. You know, there's a guy who uh, lived a number of years ago. He died 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago. Walter Kaufman, he was a professor 
a philosopher at Princeton University, was there for a number of years, a prolific writer, and he studied this whole idea of decision-making and the fear of decision. He actually call, has this term he called uh, decidophobia. People that are afraid to make a decision. They, they, they fear the anxiety that's associated with it. They fear being wrong. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, somebody had given me some, uh, a gift certificate for Christmas to Cheesecake Factory, so I went to Cheesecake Factory. Have you seen their menu there? <laughs> it's like a textbook on oceanography that is thinner than that. You know, just one page after, and it all looks really good. And I hadn't been there in a long time. I didn't know what to get. I was having decidophobia. And so I asked the server, I said, what do most people get? So she said, she told me, I said, I'll have that, you know. So, but you just, there's just so much, you're not sure how, what to do. If you have decidophobia, God wants to heal you of that. And the way he'll do that is he'll give you lots and lots of decisions to make. Because that's how we overcome that. You just make more and more decisions. And as you make them, you start to, okay, this is part of what God's doing in my life. You know, it's interesting, people do study this area of decision making, and, and there's two main categories of decision makers, and why don't you see which one you are. One, there's maximizers, the other are satisfiers. Maximizers, they want to make sure they make the best possible decision. Good is not good enough. And so they do exhaustive research to make sure they have found the best decision to make. Satisfiers will just make a decision that works. It's, it's good enough for them. And so this, uh, you can see this like um, when somebody uh, goes to a hotel, for example, and there's 400 stations, 500 stations on the TV to watch. A, a, a satisfier will just flip through until they find something they want to watch, and then they'll watch it. A maximizer, they won't do that because there could be another station that has something they would, you know, like to watch more. And so they'll go through all 400 stations <laughs> in order to find the best Station. That's a maximizer. And, you know, for, for those of you who are young and, and are looking at you know, jobs, it's, this happens in the job market as well. For a maximizer, they will do exhaustive research looking for the best job. They want to find that job. And they tend to actually get paid more. Maximizers, on average, get paid 20% more than satisfiers because satisfiers are satisfied with the job they get. You know, they just find one that's good enough. So maximizers, they actually do better, but they're less happy. They're actually less satisfied than satisfiers. <laughs> so <laughs> here's what Paul says to Timothy about it. He says, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. God wants us to grow in our decision. He wants us to make wise choices. And we make them with gusto. We don't let fear get the best of us. And so when you get up in the morning, you just make a decision. I'm going to, uh, all the decisions I make today, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to let God guide me. And when you go to bed at night, you just you think through the decisions you make and all throughout the day. God, where were you? And, you know, and help me to be more like, more like you. Help me to develop my character tomorrow. And, and we just surrender that to God and say, God, I, I, I need your help in this process. I, I do something called a daily exam. And I've talked to you before about this with St. Ignatius. It's his prayer uh, where he says, uh, it, it, you know, become aware of God's presence. This is at night as you're about to fall asleep. You become aware of God's presence throughout the day. Review the day with gratitude. Pay attention to your emotions. Choose one feature of the day and pray about that. In other words, words you sense God was moving. And then you Commit for the next day, God, I want to follow you tomorrow. Now, as we, as we talk about decisions, some of us have made some bad decisions. Some of you are saying, you know, it's too late for me. I've made unredeemable choices. You know, maybe you have, uh, you know, made a poor choice in your relationship, and now you're divorced, and it's, a, it's altered the relationship with your kids. Or maybe you've made poor choices with your kids and, and, and now there's this, uh, this huge gap and they won't talk to you. Or, or maybe, you've made, uh, maybe you've sinned publicly in some way and your reputation and your integrity has been ruined and you go, well, what about me? But here's what I want you to know. When it comes, we are not saved because of the decisions of poor, by, you know, from our poor decisions. We're saved by God's grace. 
God's grace. That's a good time to say amen, actually. God's grace <laughs> saves us. Look at the thief on the cross. He, he had a life of bad decisions. He was corrupt. He was a thief. He was, he, that greed get the best of him. Jesus is dying on the cross. And, he's, and, and, and so this thief, he makes a good decision. He says, Jesus, when you go into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus responds and he goes, today you will be with me in paradise. See, it's God's grace that covers that. And so when we start to feel shameful or guilty or all banged up or unredeemable, God says, no, no, it's my grace that saves you. And God wants to give you wisdom. Now, here's what I want you to do for me. Some of you are facing uh, important decisions. And so I want to pray for you. Okay, so I'm actually going to ask you to, to stand if you're facing, if you need wisdom on a particular situation, maybe you're a parent. You're having a difficulty with a challenge there. Then I'm going to ask you to just, you can just stand right now if that's you. If not, don't feel like you need to. If you're embarrassed about standing, that's fine. But, but many times we see that when we, when we move physically, that's a way of stating, God, I need your help here. In your work life, maybe you're feeling stuck. Maybe you're needing God to move in that situation and you're not sure you're facing a problem. I want you to stand if, if uh, you're in your marriage, you're maybe in a place of transition and you need wisdom with your marriage. What am I going to do? I've got, I've got something very significant. Maybe in your financial life, you're, you're, expressing, you're experiencing financial pressure and you need wisdom on how to address your finances. Maybe it's a relationship that's troubling you and you need wisdom there. How to, maybe it's a, a decision about how to spend your time. You say, well, you know, what's the best, what, how should I be spending my time? I don't want to waste my life. Or maybe in your spiritual life, maybe you've hit a spiritual plateau and you're stuck and you need to know what to do. Maybe it's something else, but I want to pray for you if you're standing, if you need wisdom. And that's a lot of us here. Many of you are standing because we are in a place where we say, yeah, I can make a decision, but I need to make a wise decision. I need God's help in this, okay? I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come up as I pray, uh, and you'll be invited to come up and receive prayer as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you love us. And so, Lord, I pray for everybody here who is standing in the valley of decision. They need wisdom. They're in a deep valley. Lord, I pray that you give them courageous decision-making abilities. And I pray with them right now, Lord, just give them wisdom. You can just pray that. Just say, God, give me wisdom. Like Solomon, Lord, I, that, that wisdom connects to all these other things that happen. I need wisdom. Would you say, God, give me an understanding mind and a discerning heart. Let me be able to combine strength with sensitivity. Lord, you say that when we ask, you don't give wisdom begrudgingly. You give it because you want to. So Lord, I do pray for insight and discernment and clarity beyond our human ability for everybody here. And I know that you're more interested in who we become than any circumstance we're currently facing. Who we become. That we become followers of you. That we become more like Christ. Filled with love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Goodness, self-control. If you've never put your faith in Christ, why not do that? Or maybe reaffirm that. This is a great time to do that. To say, God, today, I want to put a stake in the ground. Say, yes, I want to grow. Help me. And wash me clean by the, by, the, by the power of Christ. 
Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for me, covering all those wrong choices, all the repercussions. It doesn't go away, but I'm forgiven. And I thank you for that, Lord. But more importantly, Lord, develop in me a heart and a character that reflects how I was meant to be in the first place. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.